Mike Brown, the former FEMA director. Joining us here is the former FEMA director. History, I think, was very unkind to you, my friend. Very unkind. Mr. Brown, thanks for being with us. This is Michael Brown Unplugged. Well, happy Friday, everybody. Guess who I've guess who I've dragged out of the back alley again? Christian Toto. So it's a Hollywood and Toto segment. <laughs> Kicking and screaming, I might add. Well, yeah. Well, so what? I still managed to proving that the old man is still stronger than the young punk, who, by the way, turns fifty-one <laughs> this week. <laughs> <laughs> and also proving that hey. So that's what chloroform smells like. Cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have you back. And we should let everybody know we're going to try to do this at least once a month. And, and, and then when we can get, kind of get iHeart's act together, we might do it more. <laughs> Which means in the next century. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'll be 61. <laughs> 61. And, and I'll, uh, well, Medicare, I don't, I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> hey, listen. So. Because of, you know, because I'm subscribed to your website and because I actually sneak onto it once in a while, see if you ever say anything about me, which, of course, you never do. Um, <laughs> I, I watched Dave Chappelle. And on Thursday, in anticipation of today's podcast, I watched the Bill Burr special. Back to back. What are these guys thinking? Well, they, they're thinking. That's for starters. Yes, they that's are. That's a great thing. To a certain extent, not it's not exactly a perfect analogy, but they are kind of the of the. Um, uh, oh, it just went, it totally went out of my head. They are the um, the Lewis and Clark. Uh, yeah, the Lewis and Clark. The um, <laughs> Blazing Saddles. Uh, Mel Brooks. They are the Mel Brooks of the twenty first century. You know, it's amazing, and the fact that they came out literally a week apart is so much is is so interesting. But it, I want to dig into what was said on these specials. But also, there are some signs that the dam is breaking on the the kind of the I guess they now call it the cancel culture. And it's not just the fact that these two specials exist. I think there's other other little hints that maybe people are finally saying. Hey, th- enough is enough. We got to move forward. So we'll okay, see. So I, I, I want you look. I'm, I'm going to turn this over to you. But before okay. I turn it over to you, I, I, I would just encourage everyone. I even texted my lawyer on Thursday and said, "You must watch Chappelle and Burr." Now there are a lot of f bombs. It's crude, but if you look beyond the crudeness and you understand comedically what they're doing, they have broken the dam open. It's it's a one two. I think that uh, I have to say I think Chappelle is a much better comic. The way he uses his voice, the way he uses his body language, the way he shapes ideas is innovative. And I, I'm not picking on Bill Burr, who's excellent, but Chappelle is Chappelle. He really is the best at this point. But when he talks about the cancel culture, when he talks about what he calls the alphabet, which is LGBTQ, I mean it's it's. It's so raw and so unexpected. It's great in and of itself, but he really makes it fun. And the way he kind of uh, explores the culture and what you can say. And there's a part of me that thinks that the L special is all about poking us and making us think beyond our normal expectations. And I think that's it's even better than Burr because he's really, uh, it's, boy, it's. So. That's what you think about Bill Burr. What do you think about Dave Chappelle? You know, Dave Chappelle is considered arguably the best stand-up comic, at least he has been for a while. And I think this special really cements it. It's what he does with the material. He wades into really tough terrain. He mentions subjects that are uncomfortable. He takes some positions, which I don't agree with necessarily, but he does it in a way that's provocative and smart. And it makes you kind of reconsider your original places in these arguments. Gun control, abortion, uh, Michael Jackson. He brings up all these issues and just makes you dig deeper and say, hey, sure, this is what I think on the surface. But have I really reconsidered it? Have I really kind of thought it out properly? And with my jokes, 
I'm going to make you laugh and then make you kind of circle back. It's a fascinating approach. And he's so good and so confident and so aware of his own abilities, but not in a lazy way, but just sort of a, you know, like a, a Michael Jordan in his prime where he just knows what he can do and he delivers. And that's that was my overall assessment of his special. It's that good. I, and I agree with your point about his confidence. He does. It, it's not that he comes across cocky. He comes across as self-assured. I know that what I'm doing is pushing the envelope, and I'm I'm totally comfortable with that. And I and I don't want to give away, but you know that there's that one point where he says, "Hey, I got a couple of impersonations for you," and he does, <laughs> and he does one impersonation, and the audience laughs. You know, he tells the audience who it was, and then he does the second impersonation, and that's all I'm going to say about it, but it caused the audience to, as I like to say on the radio sometimes, I like it when I can make people's neurons or their perceptions go, and they go, oh, yeah. And I think he did that to the audience when he did that second impersonation. And that's why I'm so frustrated with comedy today, because if you watch a Stephen Colbert or John Oliver... Even if you don't know the exact punchline, you know where it's heading. You know where it's meant to attack. You know all the details of it besides the actual words. So it's not interesting. It's not surprising. It doesn't catch you off guard. It isn't what comedy is at its best. And to me, it's like if you watch a guy and he puts a a pail of water above a door and the next person who comes in the door is going to get a pail full of water. You know, it might be mildly humorous, especially the reaction, but – You see it, you know it's coming, and that element of surprise is basically gone. But what Dave Chappelle does is makes an hour full of surprises that you never see coming. And that you never see coming, and then when you you realize that you're laughing at what he just did, if if you're woke, in air quotes, if you're woke, you catch yourself laughing, and then you think, "Uh uh-oh. And it's almost... The audience, it's almost like the audience looks to the left, looks to the right, like, did anybody see me laughing about that? (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's funny. There's parts of the Bill Burr special, sorry to jump from special to special, where he recognizes the audience isn't laughing. And I think his his perspective is you can laugh at this. It's okay. I am giving you permission. Now, when I've heard some pretty raunchy material in recent weeks as a uh, a podcast I listen to that kind of goes in really tough places – even I, I, I like to think I'm open-minded. I like to think I'm okay with different comedy. I, I, it's almost like I'm self-censoring my reaction. Like, oh, I can't laugh at that. That's not approved. And that's where we are as a culture today. And, and Chappelle and Burr are saying, no, you can laugh at that. You should laugh at that. You should hear what we have to say. And then you can assess it as you wish because we're not politicians. We're trying to make something happen on stage. And we're taking something that in in everyday life, we know that these things have gone beyond the pale. They have not, not that I'm not saying their comedy has gone beyond the pale. I'm saying that the political correctness has, has gone beyond the pale. And they're saying, yes, it has. We're going to mock it, make fun of it. And, and I think you're absolutely spot on. Chappelle does it in an almost intellectual fashion that makes you laugh. Bill Burr does it in a crude fashion that makes you laugh. And I think that's the genius in both of them. They, two distinct approaches, but they're both taking on popular culture topics that – the the media and Hollywood and everybody else has told us you cannot laugh about this and they're saying hold my beer. Yeah. You know, Bill Burr is I think he's about fifty one. I'm gonna guess Chappelle's maybe his late forties. They're veterans, they're seasoned, they know how to do this. Now, if you've got a twenty two year old comedian, a guy or a gal, and they go out and they tell similar jokes or similar subjects Not so easy because the expectations are very high. The subject matter is very complicated. And to do that at this level is almost impossible when you're a young comic starting out. I've been listening to so many podcasts lately, Joe Rogan, uh, Jim Gaffigan, Bill Burr, talking about comedy, working on the the steps it takes to become – to get to that level. It's not easy. And it takes decades sometimes to get there. But I think we're at a point in our culture where we need the best – to break this down and to shed some hard truths. And I think the kids today 
may benefit from this breaking down, but I don't think they're going to lead the wave, at least not yet. So let me let me let me interject because we can't have this conversation without interjecting race into it because race permeates everything, right? Oh yeah. I, I think I think the other brilliance in and look, if you haven't figured out by now, Christian and I really want you to either borrow somebody's Netflix credentials and log in <laughs> or use your own, and we really truly want you to watch both of these specials. And you probably don't want your you probably don't even want your teenagers there, although I'm thinking I'd, in a way, I'd like for my 15-year-old teenage grandson to, to watch both of these with me so that I can pause and talk about some of the things going on. But in terms of race, both of them take on some racial stereotypes. So Chappelle takes on some black racial stereotypes. Burr takes on whiteness. <laughs> And he takes on white privilege. And here I am laughing about it because <laughs> it's been, you know, 12 hours or whatever since I've watched it. And I still think back to some of the things he said about his white privilege that just made me laugh my ass off. Yeah. And at the end of the day, let's just say that Bill Burr, one routine, one line, one kind of shtick doesn't succeed if he tries and he fails. So What? He's not running for office. He's not making policy. He's trying to make some cultural observations. And, you know, he puts out his best work on Netflix. But I guarantee, and they've, and I've, comedians talk about this all the time, how they work on their material and how they kind of manipulate it and shape it. And they use the audience feedback to say, okay, that one didn't work. That one didn't land. This one did. If I change the phrasing, if I change the adjective, if I couch it a different way – it's going to kill. But this way, not so much. And comedians deserve that space. And the fact that so many media critics absolutely blew a gasket over, over <laughs> Chappelle, and I'm not seeing the same gaskets being blown over Burr yet, or maybe it's coming very soon. It may be coming. And, and it's been a while since I – it's been – it's been maybe a week since I watched Chappelle, so I can't think of any specific examples, but I'm sure they occurred. But having just watched Burr in the past 12, 18 hours, there were a couple of times where I'm not sure sure the jokes fell flat. I think it was – I think in one, in, in one or two instances, the jokes fell flat. In a couple of instances, the audience just didn't know what to do. But you, <laughs> here's what was brilliant about – I think about Bill Burr, and Chappelle may have done the same thing. He used that awkwardness. And, and, and extemporaneously came up with some one-liners or some retorts that were, I think, having watched it, totally unplanned, totally unscripted. And the brilliance was how he handled those moments on stage, knowing that everything was being recorded. It was, it was, it was hilarious. There's one, point, there's one point of the Bill Burr speech, uh, the special, where he's talking about sex and he's talking about – sex with a woman and he's about to go into a yes. kind of a riff yes. and someone from the audience yes. yells out something that he yes. he circles back and he wants to hear it more clearly and it's fascinating <laughs> because the person in the crowd didn't really listen to what Bill Burr was saying or he was projecting his woke bona fides onto the moment and Bill Burr stops the comedy special cold recalibrates and essentially eviscerates the guy and it is that might be the most brilliant part of the whole night because how you can do that how you can not lose track of what you wanted to say how you could basically come down in that particular audience member and how you can kind of frame it in the context of where we are as a culture is fascinating to me and to to tie that back to Chappelle in that particular moment he both physically and intellectually, to your point, eviscerates the person in the audience. But he then goes into this riff about, you know, this is what came out of my mouth. This is what I was thinking. You didn't hear what came out of my mouth. <laughs> it went into your brain, and you calculated it through all the BS, you know, filters you've been told to do it. And you spout that back out. And that proves that you didn't hear a word that I was saying. And to, and he does. He just he rips the guy, the audience, an entire new one. But he did it in a way that I thought, wow, that this guy in that moment to be able to take that, to re to, 
to rejigger it in a way that throws it back out and also is a part of. It wasn't like you – it was like that was almost a seamless part of what he was trying to convey anyway. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't think it was contrived. I think it oh, was – Oh, I don't tr- think so. Yeah, it was truly somebody – because he had said something and he was – in, in an indirect way, kind of, you know, kind of looking at the audience like, you know, what do you think about this? And somebody up in the, you know, in the, in the expensive seats said something and he just took it and just his mind must have been whirling so fast. Hmm. I was man, I was impressed. Totally impressed. Yeah, and I, w- I want to take a step back briefly. Uh, it didn't get as much attention at all, but Sebastian Maniscalco, who's a very funny comedian, yes, he uh, hosted the VMAs recently. And he used a lot of his routine, his monologue, on mocking safe spaces and the current cultural trends that you and I talk about so often. And, of course, he got slammed by the media. But you take that in a crowd that was sort of woke personified, combined with Chappelle, combined with Bill Burr. And then I'm going to add something else here. They taped a Alec Baldwin roast for Comedy Central, and I believe it's airing this weekend. Basically, they they taped it, then they're going to air it a week later. But in it, uh, Caitlyn Jenner was one of the roasters or roasties, whatever you want to say. And she got hammered by jokes. They all made fun of her, you know, uh, the usual things you might think about with a trans person. And then, of course, she made some comments back. Now, I'm thinking if this happened six months ago, every media outlet would have been, how dare they? This is transphobic. I don't care that it's a roast. You can't say that. That wasn't the reaction. The media reported the jokes, and some outlet said, boy, she gave his, gave back as good as she got. But it wasn't like clutching pearls, you can't joke about this. And I almost feel like the media had to respond to Chappelle and had to respond to Bill Burr and had to respond to everyone saying enough is enough. And I don't think they could frame the Comedy Central roast the way they wanted to even a few short weeks ago. Now, maybe that's me being optimistic, but I thought that was another fascinating part of this ongoing conversation. So let me, so let me ask you this. At the beginning of the podcast, you used a phrase that you think the dam is, you know, like there, there are some leaks in the dam and it's about to break. Why do you think that? I mean, I think I know. I, I, but- enough is enough. I, I think it's hard to defend. Listen, it's one thing to keep mocking white comedians who are male and straight. But when you have you know, the Dave Chappelle's of the world coming out and even Pete Davidson who's sort of a woke millennial type. He's on Saturday Night Live. He had a, a, a an on a kind of an onstage meltdown recently and he kind of poked fun at millennials as well. I just think at some point the pendulum has to swing back. And then, ironically enough, No Safe Spaces, which is a movie all about this kind of culture, comes out in a few short weeks with Adam Carolla and Dennis Prager. I've seen it. It's amazing. I can't wait for everyone else to see it. But maybe we're talking a mini perfect storm. But, you know, the media is not going to let this go away quietly. The media is going to fight to keep the all these sort of uh, positions in place and truly – At the end of the day, when it comes to the thought police, when it comes to the free speech police, it's about power. It's about power first and foremost. And that's why this is such an exciting moment, because I think their power may be slipping. And I would love to see that happen. Oh, me too. And I think to to that point, Chappelle and Burr have power based on the ability to draw an audience, the ability to command you know, extraordinarily expensive ticket prices. They're making an extraordinarily good income, which they both refer to kind of obliquely in both of the, uh, in both of their sets. Yes, when, when you have when you have all of that coupled with the self confidence that they both have, that's a clash. That's now a clash between this power group, Chappelle, Burr, and the, those others you mentioned, and the woke community over here that says, oh, no, you, we can't do this. You're right. It's a fascinating time to be watching it. And, and I'm surprised. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that it's happening other than the fact that I do believe and I've always thought there's always there's, there's going to be a backlash because I think people intuitively know we ought to be able to laugh at ourselves. We ought to be able to laugh at other things. We ought to be able to laugh. Like, like Bill Burr, 
Bill Burr at one point laughs about Stephen Hawking. And when he did it, I cringed a little bit. But then when I actually listened to what he was saying, I thought to myself, everything I've read or seen about Stephen Hawking, if he had seen that, he probably would have laughed at it. <laughs> That's right. And I also suspect that people in what we'll, we'll call it marginalized groups, and I understand the term and I understand the, the, why we say that. I, I don't think they want to have a shield built around them. I think they want to be the butt of the joke. I mean, I think they w- I would think that you'd want to be part of the culture. I, I mean, you, you know, to be to be accepted is to be made fun of and to fire back and to laugh at ourselves. And it's to be human. And I think, you know, I think you can really tell that these are not mean spirited, cruel comedians, that there's something else going on. And uh, but I will say, I think the real sign of progress will be if a Stephen Colbert, if a Saturday Night Live skit, if some of those sort of mainstream comedy institutions, if they start joining the fray. Because until that happens, I don't think we're at the moment we want to see happen yet. Well, and and so let me be, you know, Mr. Pessimistic here. Saturday Night Live, I'll put Lorne Michaels and them in a different group. They might go down this path because they have in the past. I don't think... uh, I can't speak for Fallon or the others because I've, I've never met them or dealt with them. I've dealt with Colbert. I don't see them being able to get out of that comfort zone, mm-hmm. particularly as long as Donald Trump's president. Because Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I think, you know what? Again, I think you've got the Democrats who are all about identity politics. Yeah. And they know that if they go down this road, it, it puts a, a dent in that armor, and they don't want to do that. And, and, to, and to my point about Colbert, Fallon, and the others, I think they're just lazy. They're just lazy. <laughs> they know they've got a little niche over here, and they're not going to step out of that because they make the same amount of money regardless of the ratings or anything else. They're, you know, they've, got, they've got their contracts, and the suits at NBC and the other places are not going to do anything. I think, though, Lorne Michaels and Saturday Night Live, they may be seeing this, and they see, oh, they're getting laughs. And Lorne Michaels has the historical institutional knowledge. By the way, he's the executive producer, producer of Saturday Night Live. He may be looking at that and saying, maybe I can tiptoe back into some of those things we did back in the 70s or 80s. And maybe it's only one skit, but I'll take one skit. Yeah, I will too. There was one skit, it may be two years old already, maybe even more. It was a, a fake commercial for a woke jeans, and it was very funny. They had no shape, they had no style, they had no color, and uh, it, it shows that what that particular program can do when they train their creative firepower on this situation. But you're right. You know, there was a movie recently called Late Night. It's actually on Amazon streaming right now. I found it very disappointing. It's about a late night show. Emma Thompson is this long running host and now she's being threatened. She may lose her gig. But in that show, she was on autopilot. She was famous. She was successful. She had a name. She had the gig seemingly in perpetuity and she got lazy. And part of the, her renaissance is getting more creative. And again, I won't get into the plot, but it, it does remind me of what you just said and what the late night format is right now. It's lazy, it's predictable, and they're not going to go in a dangerous direction by any stretch. So do you think, have we beat this uh, white privileged and uh, and black un-PC guy? Have we beat this dead horse enough? <laughs> Well, one thing I will say is this weekend, there's a new special on Netflix, of all places, Chelsea Handler exploring her white privilege. So two steps forward, eight steps back. (laughs) Well, and kudos to Netflix for for doing this and airing it. And and again, um, I'll just reiterate for everybody listening to the podcast, if if you truly want to, again, get ready for an awful lot of F-bombs, get ready for occasionally cringing. But if you'll just go with an open mind and watch these two specials, I think you'll get – I think you'll learn two things. One, we really have gone off the deep end in terms of political correctness. And two, you have to admire these guys for stepping up and saying, you know what? Enough's enough. Some of this stuff is funny. And to your point, Christian, we ought to be able to laugh at ourselves. And, And they both do that. And in so and in doing that, 
take on some of the identity politics that the left is pushing down our throats, and they've taken it on. I mean, they've just taken it head on. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, you know, good. I'm glad you mentioned Netflix. Netflix is a left of center streaming platform. It's undeniable. When they get political, it goes to the left. They just signed Obama to a massive deal. A lot of their programming speaks to that. So the fact that they were able to look outside that bubble and recognize these specials needed to be aired, good for them. I think it just I think it enhances their brand. Absolutely. Well, so having said that, I I have no way of doing a segue here other than to to say that while you were gone, I played Whoopi because Whoopi delivered it to her co-hosts and The View about identity politics and blacklists. And I was like, golf clap, congratulations. And then today. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's over, isn't it? <laughs> well, I don't know. Do, do you want to set it up or do you want to just, how, how you yeah, let's do just, this Let's go for it. Here we go. Here's Whoopi on The View. How do you not look at this man and say, this is a racial problem? It's a, how do you I not? I don't think you people. Know? But we should, that, it's Trump. That, oh, really? Yes. Thank you, Master Shocking. of the Obvious, for pointing that out, <laughs> that, they, that she was talking about Donald Trump. I thought she was talking about you for a second. <laughs> how do you not look at this man and say, this is a racial problem? It's a, how do you I, not, I don't think you people, know, I don't think people right. don't think it's a racial thing. No, but, I, I, but okay. people are constantly saying, well, you always, you know, talk about race. Yeah. Well, this Play is a race card. This is a race card. The card can't get any bigger than this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is like, you don't want to constantly a giant, it out. You know, What they're talking about is the president talking, as as he said about people coming across the southern border. As you know, in the evacuation of the Bahamas, they were not vetting many of the people coming to Florida. They were just loading up airplanes and bringing people to Florida, and they weren't vetting those. And the president expressed concern that gang members and other criminals in the Bahamas may be on those planes and just – literally being dumped onto American soil without any vetting. and It's they, a legitimate concern. I thought it was a legitimate concern. But everything with Trump is seen through the racial prism because that's the new way to bring him down. I mean, the New York Times literally admitted this in those uh, leaked conversations that uh, came um, came to be, I guess, a couple of weeks ago now. It's, it's how they do it. And there's no one on The View, I'm assuming, you know, as good as we as good as Megan McCain is on the view and as helpful as she is and as strong as she is, she despises Trump almost as much as Joy Behar. So she's not going to rise to his defense. So I think what you're about to hear is just the usual blather without the context which you and I are providing. How do you how are people expected to look at this man who's trying supposedly leading us mm-hmm. and not be taken aback when he said these are very bad people very drug bad. dealers gang members and i turned to whoopi and i said well is there any evidence of that no. because i'm thinking maybe he has some drug statistics maybe he has some gang violence no, there was statistics. A, there was a warning issued at, uh, but that was February. about like sexual assault it, and it, yeah. robbery. But when you're marching with people who are holding signs that say you know we don't want to will not replace Jews us. will not replace if you you're marching amongst them, it's hard to tell you apart. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very difficult for people who may have voted for Trump, who thought he was going to do something different. It's hard for them to to, to say, yes, I think it's very hard. But this is one of the things that you have to say to yourself Mm -hmm. is, do I want this to be how people see the opposition? You know, as the opposition becomes so horrible that we are no longer even able to look at something and say, this is wrong. You know, I find fascinating about that is when she says, you know, this is the opposition and how can you look at the opposition? In essence, she's saying that he is leading or training or convincing people to look at the opposition and consider them evil. Well, I'm not so sure that um, I Quite frankly, I consider drug dealers and MS-13 and, uh, you know, gang members. I actually do consider them to be evil. Isn't it? Yeah, it seems seems like a pretty easy call. Yeah, at least it is for me. Isn't that what 
those on the left, the, the far left progressive groups, are saying about conservatives that oh, yeah. they're evil? And also what, what they're doing with Trump is they're signing saying – He's a racist, therefore his followers are racist, therefore we can't listen to what they say because we don't listen to a racist argument. I mean that's really what the last five years of leftism has boiled down to. We need to call anyone who disagrees with us racists or haters, and then therefore whatever you say doesn't have any validity because you're a racist and a hater, because they can't debate us on the merits. They can't say, well, wait a minute. If there's a mass influx of people to the country, it's certainly possible. There's, it doesn't. You don't need a, a fact or a figure to say that there maybe there are other people who will exploit that and enter the country. We've seen it on the southern border. Why would it not happen here? If you were a bad person trying to enter the country, that would be a golden opportunity to do that. So why would any country just accept an influx of people without any vetting? That's a, that's an invitation disaster. Total invitation. Last 20 seconds. The things that we see in this administration that we know are wrong, that don't fit any conceivable concept of anything we've been raised and with. And can that voter and stand up and say, it is wrong and I will no longer be complicit? Well, that was the point. They won't. And you know what was interesting about that? Megan McCain never said a word. Silence. I'm telling you, when it comes to Trump, she hates him because her and her and her late father didn't like each other. And that, no pun intended, trumps all. And that's a real shame because it's her job to push back because they aren't just attacking, attacking Trump. They're attacking all of his voters. They're attacking the GOP. They're attacking you and me. And the fact that Megan McCain can't kind of put on her big girl pants and realize that is is not doesn't it doesn't look well on her. Now, I've never been a fan of Stephen King. I just, I, I just don't read that genre. But Stephen King was on The View. I try to keep my politics separate from the stuff that I write, the stories, because I think people like story. People want story, and, you know, if they want the news, they want, the, you know, the stuff. They can go on and, and get on MSNBC, or they can go on Fox or right. whatever. Mm-hmm. But sometimes life comes along and imitates art yeah. instead of the other way around. And as I was rewriting this book, all at once, I find out we're locking little kids up in cages yeah. on the border. And I'm thinking to myself, this is like my book. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. This is yeah. like my book. There, there's not one celebrity who is outraged by kids in cages who will mention or discuss or excoriate <laughs> President Obama, who did the exact same thing. I mean, it's so phony and so obvious. And the bottom line to me is you've got scores of people rushing the border. You've got these poor kids being dragged across the border, often without their parents, sort of uh, they're, they're you know kind of brought on by other people for unsavory purposes. I mean, you, you have to address the big picture here. Nobody wants a kid in a cage by any stretch of the imagination. But there's a reason it's happening. And it did happen during the Obama years. And not only did the media give him a complete pass in it, till this day, no journalist has raised, it, raised his or her hand and said, Mr. Obama, why did you do this? What are your thoughts on this? No one's going to ask that question, which means it's political. <laughs> to- totally, totally, totally. Okay. Well, listen. Hey, thanks for coming on. It was good to see you again. Show sure enough. Yeah. So I was, all, I was ready we'll, to bear. We'll have to do it again pretty soon. Don't right. let me forget to remind people that if you want to read Christian's articles, be sure and get to HollywoodInToto.com and follow him on Twitter at HollywoodInToto. Right? That's it. All right. I'll talk to you later. Take care. All right. Thanks. I always love talking to Christian, and, and I, I really do do hope that you uh, uh, go to his website and sign up for his newsletter and follow him on Twitter. Speaking of which, uh, thanks for listening to this episode of Michael Brown Unplugged. And you know the drill, iTunes, iHeart. Uh, and if you want to follow on social media, you simply go to the website, michaelbrowntoday.com, michaelbrowntoday.com. Everybody have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you again on Monday.